Hey guys, sorry this second video took so long to get out, but I think it'll be pretty interesting. It's on binary search trees, um, specifically in their application to the UIL computer science program. So let's get right into it with a quick introduction of um, trees, and then we'll get into binary trees, and then finally binary search trees. So the first thing we need to talk about are nodes. And nodes are just the elements in the trees, right? Um, they're the elements in the data structure we're talking about. For example, you know, with an arrays, with arrays you have, um, you know, each element being in a different index. Um, for binary trees, um, the the most basic unit is the node, and these have these typically have values associated with them. Um, in the, in a lot of the examples um, that we have in this presentation, um, the values will be integers, um, but they can also be other things like characters. Um, so in a tree, in a general tree. Nodes have pointers to other nodes. Um, for example, if A points to X, if there's a connection from A to X, then X, we call X the child of A, or A is the parent of X. Um, and then similarly, if you have A um, has a connection to B, then B is a child of A, but now both X and B are the children of A, which means X and B are sibling nodes. So it's just a bit of terminolo terminology right there. Um, and these connections that we have, you know, from A to X and A to B, these are called edges. And they're specifically directed edges because A connects to X, not the other way around, right? There's a connection from A to B, but not a connection from B to A. So these connections are directed edges. And for a general tree, we have the following stipulations. Um, one is that there are no duplicate pointers or references. Um, for example, here, um, you know, in this tree that we have on the right, um, there's an edge from one to two, and there's not a second edge from one to two, right? There's no duplicate edges, no parallel edges. Um, and then we also have that each node has at most one parent. Um, so for any given node, it will not have more than one parent. Um, and in fact, all of the um, nodes in this tree um, have one parent except for the root node. And these two stipulations, you know, regarding duplicate pointers and the number of parents a uh, node can have, are pretty much just to ensure that there are no cycles in the tree, meaning that you can't take a path of edges from a node and get back to that node. Um, like in this tree on the right, you can't take a path of edges from one and get back to one. Um, as you can see, it only goes downwards, right? Um, and so in general, all trees do not have cycles. Um, of course, unless you're talking about this one on the left, but that's a, a very rare case, right? Um, and then, so another thing that we have with trees is that there are no pointers to the root, um, which means that the, the root is, there's one node in the tree, the root, that is not the child of any node. Um, so for example, here in this tree, we have the root being one. Why? Because it's the only node in the tree that is not the child of any node, right? There's no pointer from some node to node one. Um, and you'll also see that it's the root because all of the other nodes um, are connected to the root. You can reach every other node from the root. Um, so this is a tree in general. Um, and what I showed on the right is not actually a general tree. I mean, it is a tree, but it's a spe specific case of a tree. It's a binary tree. And so a binary tree is um, where each node has at most two children, meaning it can have zero children, one child, or two children. Um, and each child, the you have a left child and you have a right child. So in this example on the right, one's left child is two and its right child is three. Um, and so you can see examples of the one, two, and zero, one, and two children. All these leaves on the bottom, um, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, and 14 have zero, cho zero children. Um, you have, for example, six, node six and node seven that only have one child. And then you have the other nodes having two children. And so this is a valid binary tree um, because not only does it satisfy the conditions for a general tree, which is having 
um, no duplicate pointers, references, and no pointers to the root. Um, but it also satisfies the conditions of each node having at most two children. So that is a binary tree. Here is that um, up closer. It's the same image from before. Um, and you'll just notice that um, you know each node has zero, one, or two children. And so here's a bit of terminology right here. So here we have the root node, and it is the node that um, has a path to all, all of the other nodes in the tree. Um, and it's, it's also the node that is not a child, the only node that's not a child. Um, here you have the edges, which are the connections between the nodes, which you've covered. Um, here we have the parent-child relationship that we discussed. Um, in this example, there is a connection, an edge from two to four. Um, meaning that four is a child of two. And then uh, because both four and five are children of two, we call them sibling nodes. Um, and then if you go to the, the most bottom layer of leaves that do not have children, um, these are the leaves in the, in the binary tree. So a, a leaf in a binary tree is a node that has no children. And then here, is something we use to um, talk about the levels of nodes in the tree. Um, so basically the depth of a node is the number of edges you have to take to get from the root to that node. So for the root node, of course, you don't have to take any edges to get from the root node to the root node. So its depth is zero. Um, if you look at all of the edges on this level or all of the nodes on this level, you'll see that you have to take one edge from the root to get to these um, nodes two and three. And so nodes two and three have a depth of one. And then as you keep on going down, you can see that the depth is just the number of edges to get from the root node to the node you're looking at. Um, so that's the depth. That's how you determine the depth of a node. Okay, so now that we've covered trees and binary trees, we can finally get to the binary search tree. And the binary search tree is a special case of a binary tree um, and in a sense that the left child, remember we have a left child, left child and a right child in a binary tree. Now in the, in the binary search tree, the left child is smaller than the parent node and the right child is larger than the parent node. And this is recursively defined. There's some quick notes about binary search trees. Um, the first node inserted into the binary search tree is always the root. Um, and then when you're inserting a new element, you're going to start from the root and then go downwards based on, you know, do you want to go left or right, right? You want to go left if you're trying to insert a new element that is less than the root. And you want to go right if you're trying to insert that element that's greater than the root, right? Um, and so we're going top to bottom when we're inserting elements. Um, also notice here that the, the root of, of the binary search tree is not necessarily the smallest. Right, because the first element we insert into the binary search tree is the root. Um, and so that might not be the smallest, right? And we know it's not the smallest if it has a left child. So let's look at this example on the right. Um, we have this sequence of integers, um, 6, 1, 2, 0, 3, 9, 2, 10, 8, 11. Um, and we're asked, if you insert these integers from left to right, what would the BST look like? Um, so let's think about this. Uh, okay, so we place six. Six is the first element that we're inserting. Um, so it will be the root. Um, then we go to, to one. One is less than six, so we, we make one the left child of six. Two, um, two is smaller than six, and two is greater than one, and so it should go there. Um, and if you keep on following this pattern, um, this will get you the binary search tree that you see here. Um, and if you notice, in this binary search tree, we actually have two duplicate items with the value being two. And here, we elect to place the duplicate element to the left of its copy. And whenever you have a binary search tree problem and it allows for duplicate values, it will almost always tell you what to do with duplicate values. So in this example, we decided to place um, a duplicate value to the left of its copy, um, but the program might specify otherwise. Um, but just, just don't worry about that. Um, you'll you'll be notified when you have to place it to the left or to the right 
or not include the duplicate. Um, here's some, some quick interesting properties of binary search trees that um, might help you with some problems. Um, you know, the, the first question is, you know, where's the maximum element? You know, you just, if you just think about this, um, all elements that are greater than a node are going to the right. So if you keep on taking that right link, you should get to the maximum element in the tree, right? Because the maximum element in the tree will be to the right of every node on this path. It's going to be greater than the root. It's going to be greater than that node, greater than that node. So the maximum element, um, if inserted into this tree, would be placed to the right of 14. Um, so what you can do to, to actually find the maximum element is you just traverse the right spine of the BST, which means you start at the root and you repeatedly take the right link or follow the right pointer um, to the right child until um, there is no more right child. And then that is the maximum element. And similarly, if you want to find the minimum element, um, you simply traverse the left spine of the BST, which means you repeatedly take the left link to the left child as many times as you can. Um, and then you have these two, another two questions that kind of spawn off of these previous two questions. Um, one of them is, how do you find the node with the next largest value to x? So for example, if you're looking at, um, if you want to find the node with the next largest value to x with x being in the binary search tree, then you simply, you find x. So for example, if we're thinking about three, if you want to find the node with the next largest value to node three, you'd find three, then you'd go to the right child with the six, and then you traverse the left spine. Um, because if you notice what you're doing is you're finding the minimum uh, element in the right subtree of three which is essentially finding um, the node with the next largest value to three. Um, and this can be useful for um, several things. One is um, node deletion in a binary search tree. Um, this is something you might wanna look up later. It's pretty interesting. Um, and there's, there's some other applications as well. And then there's um, similarly, how do you find the next smallest value to X with X being in the tree? Um, you, you just find X in the tree you go to the left child and then you traverse the right spine. So those are just some interesting properties about binary search trees. There's many more, um, but these might help you a little bit. So let's um, talk about coding the binary search tree, right? Because this is what you're gonna uh, be doing in the hands-on component um, of the UIL computer science programming contest. So this is a tree that we're gonna wanna construct, right? We have nodes, 539, 146, um, and we also have edges between nodes that connect them. So we want to simulate this in a Java program. Um, so in order to represent this structure, we're going to make a static inner class called node. And it's gonna represent one of the nodes in the tree. And it's gonna have a value. We're gonna make it an integer value, right? And then we're gonna have a pointer to a left node and a right node, right? So we have node left and right. And um, we just have this constructor method so that whenever we construct a node, we can pass in a value and have it set. So what this does is we're creating a binary search tree class. We're, we're defining a, an inner static class, a static inner class called node that defines what a node is and defines connections between nodes. And then we have a root node in the binary search tree. And that, that root node will connect to other nodes in the tree forming the complete tree. And so we'll see this in a little bit. So now let's say we're given a binary search tree. Say we have a bunch of nodes in it with connections to each other, right? We have a, a non-null root node and it's connecting to a left child and right child and those ch children connect to other nodes, right? Say we're given this binary search tree representation and we wanna search for a value. Um, in this example, let's try searching for four. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the root node, which is five, um, and then we're going to progressively get um, into deeper levels of the tree. Um, and we do that by comparing the target um, search value, the target value to the node we're currently looking at. So because we're starting at the root, we compare our target value four to five. Um, and we notice that four, our target value is less than the node we're looking at. So we should take the left child or the left link. And so we arrive at this new node three. 
And so now we compare our target value to 3. Um, and we notice that it's larger than 3. So we should take the right child, or the right link. And over at this step, we notice that um, the target value and the value of the current node are actually, are actually the same value. And so this means that we found the value, we found the node in, this, in the binary search tree that we're looking for. And so this is called a search hit. Um, we found the value we're looking for. If, if we didn't find the value we were looking for, it would have been a search miss. Um, so now let's think about how do we code uh, a binary search tree? How do we code what we just saw? Um, given our static node inner class and our, our, our variable instance variable root, right? So we have this find method that you would call and you have your int value, which is your search value, your target value. And we want to the first we're first going to first going to define a search method that recursively finds a value. Um, you see here, we'll, we started off from the root, and we we have the value of course. Um, and this is because we start at the root and then go downwards, right? So if we if our if our if the value we're looking at right now if the if the, the current node we're looking at is null, that means that the value wasn't in the tree, right? Because say for example instead of four at, um, at the spot in the binary search tree, it was five. Then we'd take a left linked because four is less than five, but four wouldn't exist. It would be a, a null, um, and it would be a, a null pointer, right? And so if, if that happens, if, if, if you ever come across a, a node that's null, you want to return null because that means that the element you're looking for does not exist in the tree. Um, because if you follow that path to get to the element, you must arrive at that element if it exists. If it doesn't exist, then you arrive at a null pointer. Okay, so we handle the case if the current node is null, we return null because the, the node does not exist in the tree with the given search value. Um, then we test if, you know, is, is the search value that we're looking at, is it the same as the current node's value? And if it is, that means we have a search hit, we found the node we're looking for, and so we should just return that node, which is current, right? Um, and then the other case is if it's less than or greater than. So if the search value is less than the current node's value, then you want to continue the search from the left subtree, right? Because the left subtree contains all nodes whose values are less than the given node, the parent node. Um, but if the, uh, in this case, the value is greater than the current value, and so we should continue the search from the right um, child, or the right subtree. So this is how you um, code uh, an, a find method in Java um, recursively. Now there's also this um, iterative solution that you might like better. Um, and so instead of using recursion, you're using a while loop. Um, what you do, it's, it's, it's a very similar process. You start at the root. So you set this, this node x to root. Um, and while you're not at a null link, or while you don't arrive at a null link, um, you test the value of the node you're looking at. You test the value of node x, right? So if your search value is less than the node's value, you set x to x on left because you're basically continuing continuing your search from the left child. Um, else, if the value is greater than, than the node's value, you want to continue your search from the right child. So x is equal to x dot right. And then if, these if those two conditions are not true, then the only other condition is that the value is equal to x dot value. And in that case, you found the node you're looking for and you should return that node, which is x. And so you keep on doing this. You'll notice if, if, you, if you follow this trace, um, it, it, it repeatedly goes down the binary search tree level by level and looks for the target value. And so this is just another solution if you don't want to worry about the recursive way. And of course, if you get to the end of the while loop and you hadn't returned a node, that means that the, the node simply does not exist in the tree. And so you should return null. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about the about searching for an element in a binary search tree. Um, and you might be wondering why we talked about searching for an element before we talked about inserting elements into the binary search tree. Um, and that's because inserting elements into a binary search tree is just a little bit harder with the recursion. Um, okay, so let's let's first start off with what, what steps we would take to insert an element into a binary search tree, and then we'll get to the, the code. So 
Say we wanted to insert um, a node with value 10. So again, we always start at the top of the root and we do our comparisons like always. 10 is greater than five. So if we were, into, if we were to insert it, it would go to the right of five. Um, so then we arrive at node nine and 10 is greater than nine as well. So if we were to insert it, it would go to the right of nine. And then we notice that there is a null link, right? Um, nine's right child is a null node. There is no node there. Um, and so there are no more comparisons to make. What we can do at this step is just go ahead and insert our node with value 10 over there. So we just create the node there. And that's how node insertion works. So let's get to the code for doing this. Now, the, the problem is over here, when we're inserting an element, um, we have to first find out that the element is null or the, the current node is null before we insert the element there. But when we insert the element there, we would need to have kept track of um, what the parent node was so that we can set, like for in this example, we need to keep track of nine so that we could set nine's right child to 10. But the problem is we have to, to first um, um, determine that nine's right child is actually null. And so an easy way to, to take care of this is we're actually gonna recursively rebuild our binary search tree on the way down, right? As we're comparing values, we'll recursively rebuild our tree. And you'll see how this makes it a lot easier. Um, so what we do is we have our add node method here that takes um, an integer argument, and that's gonna be the value of the node that we insert. And we're going to set root to this method that returns a node. And so as you can see, we're, we're recursively rebuilding the tree all the way from the beginning at root, right? So let's look at this add node recursively method. So it takes that current node that we're on, which is a root at originally, and then it has this value here, which is the value of the node that we're trying to insert. So um, let's skip this first condition real quick and let's get to the second condition. If value is less than or equal to current.value, um, current.left is equal to that. So basically what's happening here is uh, one thing you might notice is that less than or equal to, so we're gonna re-elect to place um, duplicate elements to the left. Uh, so if, if the search value or the, the target value that we're inserting, um, if that's less than or equal to the current value, then it would need to be inserted into the left subtree of the current node, right? And so current.left, so we're gonna rebuild the node from the left child. So current.left is equal to, and then it calls itself again with current.left and value. So it's rebuilding this tree now from the left child. And notice it's not gonna change any of the values um, on the way down, it's simply going to, um, it makes it so that you can keep track of the parent. Um, because once you come across, if you see this, if current is equal to null, return new node. Once you come across that condition, then that will return a new node here, and that will be set to the um, left child of current. So now we now we have some way of keeping track of, you know, um, what is the, the parent node that um, gets us to that null link. Um, and so similarly, you have, if the value is greater than the current dot value, um, you want to set current dot right equal to, and then we call the method from current dot right. Um, so as you can see, this is just rebuilding, this is recursively re rebuilding the tree on the way downwards. Um, it might be a little bit complicated at first, but if you just, um, just trace the code and think about it, um, it makes, it makes complete sense. Um, because, you know, for example, if, if your tree didn't have any elements, what would happen? Um, current would be null immediately and you'd return new node. So root would be that new node, right? That's what we want. Um, and then for example, if you only had a tree with one element and you're trying to insert an element with a value less than that, um, so root would be equal to that. Um, if current is equal to null, it's not null. So value is less than current.value. So we say current.left is equal to add node recursively of current.left value. Now current.left is null. So when it gets called recursively, it'll return the new node of the value and it'll set that um, the, the roots left node or left pointer to that um, new node that we created. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but if, if you just go through the steps, you'll figure out that this is um, a really, simple solution compared to something else you might come up with 
using a more naive solution. Um, so this is very important to, to know. Um, so just make sure that you, you know how this, this method works. Um, and, and remember that when you're doing insertions into a binary search tree, you're recursively rebuilding the tree on the, on the way downwards. It's not as easy as um, just a simple search. Um, so now let's look at some, some of the performance um, statistics here. Um, when you're doing a search, what, what's happening, right? When you're doing a search, you're starting at the root and then you're successively taking left or right links downwards until you find the element you're looking at. Now, we discussed previously what the depth of a node means, right? The depth of the node is the number of links or edges you have to take to get from the root to the node you're looking at. So if you think about it, when you're searching for a node, um, it's taking time proportional to the depth of the node, right? Because at each step, whenever you're doing a comparison, you're moving down one level. Um, so in the best case, what's, what, um, what's the best case, right? The best case is um, the node you're looking for is the root node. So for example, in this um, binary search tree on the right, if you were searching for five, um, then you'd get it on the first try, right? You wouldn't have to do any comparisons um, after five. It would just be one and done. So that's constant time. Um, if you think about the average case, um, and the average case being you insert n random elements into your binary search tree, um, it actually turns out that um, the average depth or the average path length from the root to any given node is roughly logarithmic in the number of elements in the binary search tree. Um, and and that, that's just because um, there, there's, there's a good mathematical proof for that if you want to look it up. Um, but that, it just turns out that the average path length from the root to any given node is logarithmic, logarithmic and m, which means that the depth from the depth of any given node that you're searching for is on average logarithmic in n. And so you can expect a search to be um, a logarithmic time operation. Um, and then let's talk about the worst case. So, you know, what's, what's the worst case? Well, if you think about it, the worst case is you're not filling up levels. Um, it's just whenever you insert a new element, it creates a new level. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? We could insert, you know, if we inserted three, it would fill up this level here, and we can insert, you know, one and, two, and four and everything like that. But here, all of the nodes in the binary search tree are creating a new level because we're in, we're inserting them in ascending order, right? So if we insert them in ascending order, this is this is a worst case scenario. Um, we'd place five, and then six goes to the right of five, and then seven goes to the right of five and six and just end up with a sort of linear um, binary search tree. And this is a worst case scenario. Another worst case scenario is if you did it, um, if you inserted the elements in descending order, which is the same thing, but you're taking left links instead. And so in this case, what you're doing is, um, if it, the worst case scenario here is if you search for seven, right? If you're searching for seven, you have to follow all the links in the tree, um, which means pretty much looking at all the nodes in the tree, right? You have to make a comparison with five, comparison with six and a comparison with seven. So this is um, this takes time proportional to n, which is the number of elements in the binary search tree. Um, it's it's almost as like you had a linked list, right? A singly or a singly linked list. And if you're searching for the last element in that linked list, you have to start from the beginning and then go all the way down. Um, so yeah, just remember that the worst case is if you're inserting the elements in um, ascending order or descending order. Then you have insertion, which is very similar um, to the performance for search. Um, because remember, for search or insert or for insertion, what you're pretty much doing is you're almost searching for where the element would be, and you're inserting the element there, right? Um, so this insertion also takes time proportional to the depth, but this time the depth of where the node should be, right? So in the best case, for example, if you have an empty binary search tree. Um, and you're inserting an element, the best case, um, that is the, that, that's, that's the best case scenario, right? Um, you don't have to make any comparisons. You can just set the root equal to the node that you want to be put into the tree. Um, and so that, that's constant time. That's if you're inserting into a, an empty binary search tree, right? Um, the average case, again, if you think about um, 
the average path length from a root to a node being logarithmic and n. If you have n random elements in the tree and you're inserting uh, you're inserting a another random element, um, it, it's not um, difficult to acknowledge that the depth of of this element that you're inserting is probably also logarithmic if all of the other um, deaths were logarithmic on average. So the average case when you're inserting is um, also logarithmic in the number of elements in the binary search tree. And the worst case, again, you have this sort of linear structure here with the binary search tree when you insert them in um, ascending or descending order. You know, if you want to insert eight into this binary search tree, you have to go through all of the other nodes in the binary search tree to get to where you want to be. So that's going to be linear in the number of elements in the tree. So now let's talk about, we've, we've talked about, you know, um, basic operations, inserting elements into a binary search tree and searching for elements. These are, these are key operations, right? Now let's talk about tree traversals. So when we're thinking about, when we're thinking about traversals, we're thinking about um, somehow looking at all of the elements in the binary search tree, but in some predefined um, order. So the first um, type of traversal is the in order traversal. And what this is simply doing is um, graphically is you're just dropping the elements downwards. If you see in this example, you just literally drop the elements downwards and the resulting order is the in order traversal. Um, you can also think about the, the in order traversal as um, the elements in sorted order. Um, why? because you're going from left to right in the binary search tree. Um, and it logically makes sense that if you go from left to right, you're going from the least to the greatest because the, the leftmost node should be the, the least and the rightmost node should be the greatest. Um, so that's what it, that's what an in-order traversal is. Um, if you're given it graphically, I will just drop the elements down um, as you see here. If you're given, if you're given, if you want to find the in-order traversal given some code, um, just literally sort the elements that you're putting into the binary search tree and that gets you the in order traversal um, so how do you code this in order traversal um, it's actually pretty simple um, what you do is you you tra you traverse the left subtree you print the current value and then you traverse the right subtree um, so for example if you start from the root um, when you start with from the root you're going to call in order on the left subtree and you're going to keep on calling in order on the left subtree until you get to a null um, node. Um, and then you're going to print out that um, that node's value. Um, then you're going to print the right subtree and then you're going to backtrack. And so what actually happens if, as if, you, if you see this here, um, you know, you, you start from the root, you, you traverse left subtree to get to one, traverse left, sub, left tree to get to left subtree to get to zero. Then you print, um, because there is no left subtree, you print zero. There's no right subtree. You backtrack from zero to one. Now at this point, you've you've um, you've handled the left subtree, so now you can print one. And then you traverse the right subtree. You get to two. Um, there is no left subtree, so you print two. There's no right subtree, so you backtrack from two to one. Now you've traversed the left subtree, printed one, and traversed the right subtree of one, so you can backtrack from one to three. So now you've handled left subtree of three, so you can print three. And then you want to handle the right subtree of three. Um, so we go to the right to five, node five. And then from here, you want to traverse the left subtree of five, which is four. There's no left subtree of four. So you print four, no right subtree of four. So you backtrack from four to five. Now you've handled the left subtree of five. You can print five, and then you handle the right subtree of five, which are, there is none. And so if you think about it, what you're doing is you're essentially reading off the elements from left to right in the binary search tree, starting from the leftmost element, going to the rightmost element. And again, you can just you can just trace this code and logically ensure that it works or you know run it on a bunch of different binary search trees and it will print out the elements in ascending order. Okay, so now we have the pre-order traversal, which is a little bit more difficult. Um, and so these are the steps done uh, recursively. You, you visit a node, you print its value, then you traverse the right, the left subtree, and then you traverse the right subtree. So in this example on the right, you start from the root. Right, we always start from the root. Um, we visit the node, we print its value. So we print three, that's down here. 
Um, then we traverse the left subtree. We have one, we print one, traverse the left subtree, and then we print zero. There's no more um, left subtree or right subtree, so we backtrack from zero. At this point, we printed one, we've traversed the left subtree. Now we traverse the right subtree to get to node two. Um, we print two, it doesn't have left subtree or right subtree, so we backtrack from two to node one. Now we've um, printed one, we've traversed the left subtree of one and the right subtree of one. So now we backtrack from one to three. Um, and at node three, at this point, we've printed three. We've traversed the left subtree of three. Now we traverse the right subtree of three. So we go to node five. Here we print five. Um, then we traverse left subtree of five, which is four, or node four. Um, we print four. There is no left subtree. There is no right subtree. So we backtrack from four at this um, to node five. And at this point, we we printed five. We traverse the left subtree of five. There is no right subtree of five. Um, sorry about that. There is no right subtree of five. So what we do is we backtrack from five to three, and we are done. Right at when we backtrack from five to three, we've printed three. We've traversed the left subtree of three and we've traversed the right subtree of three. So this is this is the tr the pre-order traversal, right? You, you print out a node's value, you, then you traverse the left subtree, then you traverse the right subtree. Um, you can contrast this to the in-order traversal steps, which were also done recursively, where you actually traverse the left subtree of three, then you printed the value, and then you traverse the right subtree of three. Um, and so there's not any particular, you know, order into this to this uh, the pre-order it's not like in order where it's in a setting order it's just a, a, a predefined order for traversing a binary search tree um, and you know one of the ways you can do this if you're given it graphically if you're given the graph graphically or the tree graphically um, you can use this traversal table which is a little thing that I came up with for um, handling pre-order traversals and post-order traversals which you'll see in a little bit um, on any graph. Um, so let's get into um, traversal tables. So let me just switch to this screen here. Um, I'm just going to copy this binary search tree now. So we have three. Let me see. Three. Go into one. Go into zero and two. And then three is going to five on the right, and it's going to four there. So I think that is the same tree. Okay, so let's talk about this um, traversal table. Basically, what you do is <clears throat> you draw this vertical line here. The what we write on the left will be the nodes we're looking at or what we're printing out, and what we draw what we write on the right of the line will be the, the the children of the node we're looking at. So you'll see it'll make a lot of sense uh, in a little bit. So we start from the root node, right? And this this is this traversal table is specifically for figuring out the pre-order traversal and the post-order traversal. Okay. So we start from node three. If you notice from the presentation, what we did was we would have printed out its value. Um, so we'd print out three, right? Um, and then we want to traverse the left subtree and then the right subtree. So what do we do here? Um, so we want to traverse the left subtree and then the right subtree. So we're going to write the children of three here, right? Because the left sub the left child of three is one, and the right sub the right child of three is five. Um, and then we're going to recursively go down. So for one, we're going to cross out one and write it here. Um, we want to handle the case for one. Right, um, so we would have printed out one at this point, and then we want to look at the left left child of one and the right child of one, which is zero and two. So now it's handle zero because it's the left left uh, subtree, um, and then we come to zero and we would print out zero. But notice that zero doesn't have a left child or a right child. And so what we'd actually do is we'd backtrack from zero. So what I do is I just put an X there. And then at this point, what you want to do is you, go, you want to go to the most recent um, entry in the table that does not have an X to the left of it. And so that's our, um, our entry with node one, right? So for node one, we've handled, we printed one, we've handled less of tree. 
Now we should handle the right subtree, which is two. So that's, we're gonna put two there. Um, we would print two, all right? Um, and then we would, um, two doesn't have a left um, child or a right child, so we would backtrack from two. The most recent one that doesn't have an X is still node one, the entry but node one. And now you've no you'll notice that at this point, we've printed node one, we've handled its left subtree, and we've handled its right subtree, so we can backtrack from one as well. So we're going to place an X to the left of one. And then the most recent one is uh, three, the entry with node three. And so at this point, we printed three. Um, we've handled left subtree of three, which is one. And now we want to handle the right subtree of three, which is five. So we're going to write five down on the table. Um, five, or so we would print five here, right? And then we would, uh, we have the left child of five being four, and it doesn't have a right child. So let's handle four, the left subtree of five. And then four, we would print four, and it doesn't have left child or right child, so we'd backtrack from four, and get back to five, which is the most recent entry uh, without an X. And now we've noted we noticed that uh, we printed five and we handled all possible subtrees of five because there are no more children on the right of the table um, to handle. So we backtrack from five, and you'll see this takes us takes us all the way back to the entry with node three. Um, and if you notice, we we printed three and we've handled the left and right sub um, trees of three. Right, there are no more children of three to process. And so at this point, you just um, cross out, you do backtrack from three and you'd be done with the pre-order traversal. Um, so this is just a way of writing out all of the um, recursive pre-order traversal steps um, without having to, you know, memorize, um, you know, which node you came from when you're backtracking, because that can get a little bit confusing. So this is really just a method of keeping track of um, the nodes that you visited so far and which nodes you have to visit. And this actually works um, on any graph, when you do a pre-order traversal on any graph. Um, if you notice, what happened here was the pre-order traversal, 310254, is actually just this part of the table, right? So we didn't even, we didn't even have to write down um, this, this order as we were going because it's simply if you, if you look at the traversal, the pre-order traversal, as soon as we visit a node, we print its value. So yeah, as soon as we, we process a node in this table, we can we know that it's it's um, being inserted into the pre-order traversal. So what we can do is, when we're, whenever we're drawing these traversal tables, is we can just you know go through all these steps, do all the backtracking, and at the end, this vertical order here, going from top to bottom, is the pre-order traversal. <laughs> And this will make it a little bit easier when we're also trying to find out the post order, as we'll see in a little bit. But I hope I hope this table makes sense, and it hope I hope it simplifies the process a little bit. Instead of trying to use, um, you know, there, there there are many methods that we tried to use um, a few years back when we're doing uh, pre order traversals or post order traversals. But I think this is the most definitive method, and it works on any graph, not just a tree or a binary search tree. And for, for other for a general graph, what you would do is instead of just having the left and right child on the right side of the table, you would put all the children of a node there. All right, so that's the traversal table um, for figuring out the pre-order traversal. Um, how would you how would you code the pre-order traversal? You know, because we have these um, recursive steps here, you visit the node, you traverse left subtree, then you traverse right subtree. Our method for pre-order traversal is you simply start from the root, um, which you pass in when you call the pre-order method. Um, if you're, the current node you're looking at is null, you just return out of it. You don't want to print anything, right? Because it doesn't have any children or a value. Um, otherwise, if it has a value and possibly children, you print out the value, you visit the node, and then you traverse the left subtree, and then you traverse the right subtree. Um, so that's all it is. It's just a, a variation. When you're, when you're looking at all of these traversals, or most of these traversals, um, they're just variations of each other, right? The, the in-order traversal, it, you traverse the, right, the left subtree, and then you print out the value, and then you traverse the right subtree. For pre-order traversal, you it's, it's pre, right? So you can think about pre, you should do it before. You want to print the value before. Um, so you're printing the value before, and you're doing left and then right. And you'll notice that 
you're always going to be traversing the, the subtrees in the, in the order of left and then right. It's not going to be right and then left ever, right? Um, so that's the pre-order traversal. And then you have the post-order traversal, which is another variation where instead of, the, instead of printing out the value and then traversing the left and right subtrees, you first traverse the left and right subtrees, and then you print out, um, then you print out the value. And in this case, we also use a traversal table. And so I'm going to show you how to do that right now. So we have 315024. Great. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to <clears throat> undo some of these things on the table. Um, we'll start from the beginning. As you'll see, you can use this traversal table to figure out both the pre-order traversal and the post-order traversal at the same time. Okay, so um, we know that the vertical order going from top to bottom on the left side of the table is going to be the pre-order traversal. Um, so we don't need a we don't need something at the bottom for that, but we do need a little list as we go for the post-order traversal. Okay, so we're going to start at three. Um, again, we have um, the left child is one, the right child is five. So we should um, process one. One's left child is, or has a left child and a right child is zero and two. We want to process the left step tree first. Um, zero. Okay, so zero doesn't have any children. So we'd actually backtrack from here. Now, the key the key over here with post word traversal is as soon as you backtrack from a node, you want to insert that into the post order traversal. You want to append that to the post order traversal order that you already have. So as soon as you backtrack backtrack from zero, we're going to add that to our post order traversal. And you're going to keep on doing that whenever you have to backtrack. And that, that's the only step you, you're adding to this. Okay, so we backtrack from zero, we get to the entry with node one. Now we process its right um, subtree, which is node two. So we handle two here. Two doesn't have a left or right subtree. So now we backtrack out of two and then add it to the post order traversal. So now we backtrack to one um, and notice that um, we've, we've handled the left and right um, subtrees of one. So now we're going to backtrack out of one, add it to the post order traversal. And then, so that's backtracking to node three. So now we've handled the left subtree of node three. Now we should handle the right subtree of node three. Okay, that's five. Um, let's see, so five has only a left subtree, which is four. So let's try to handle that. Four doesn't have any subtrees. So we backtrack out of four. We add it to the post order traversal. Um, so we backtrack to five, right, from four, we backtrack to five. Um, we've handled left subtree, there isn't a right subtree. Um, right, there's nothing else to cross out on the right side, so now we backtrack out of five. We add it to the post order traversal. And now you notice um, that the most recent entry that doesn't have an X is the entry with node three. And if you notice, we've, we've uh, already traversed the left subtree and the right subtree of three. And so we can finally backtrack out of three. Now, the bottom is the post-order traversal. It's the order we backtrack. Uh, that's the order of backtracking, pretty much. Um, and then, uh, so that's the post-order traversal. And then if you want the pre-order traversal, remember, you can just look at this order going from top to bottom. And that is your pre-order traversal. Um, and so if you go back here, 0, 2, 1, 4, 5, 3. 0, 2, 1, 4, 5, 3. So it matches up. So this is how you can use the the um, this little traversal table to um, to determine the pre-order traversal and the post-order traversal at the same time um, in a relatively quick manner uh, without having to worry about um, not memorizing something when you're doing the traversal in your head. And a great thing, again, um, which I think is very helpful, is you can use this traversal table on any graph whenever you're doing a pre-order traversal or a post-order traversal on any graph. So. Um, it might be helpful for help for you, or you might have a better way of doing it, but um, it's just something to think about.
So again, for coding the post order traversal, um, this time we're traversing the left subtree, then the right subtree, and then we're printing out the value. Um, it's exactly what we did um, in that traversal table, and it's exactly the recursive steps we have listed down on this slide. Okay, so now let's talk about another type of traversal where it gets um, or it deviates a little bit from the pattern. And this is the level order or the breadth first traversal. Um, and so it's very easy, easy to determine this, this traversal visually. Um, to, to do that, you simply read the, the binary search tree from the top level to the bottom level. And on each individual level, you read the nodes from left to right. So for example, on this tree, we're looking at levels, horizontal levels, right? We're going from top to bottom. And on each individual level, we go from left to right. So we do three, one, five, zero, two, four. And that is the level order or the breadth first traversal. Um, and this level order of a binary search tree is the same. It's the same um, code as the um, as that for the um, the breadth first search traversal of a graph in general. Um, but just to make sure, if we're using that same code to add the left child before the right child, um, and you'll see that in a little bit. So here's the, here's the code for, for this level order traversal of a binary search tree. So we're going to use our classic um, BFS traversal of a graph, um, again, with that condition where we add left child before the right child. And so to do that, we, we use our FIFO queue as always, right? First in, first out, where the element we remove from the queue is the least recently added. Um, and if you're not familiar with FIFO queues, I recommend going over that real quick and then coming back to the presentation. So what we do is we add the root node to an empty FIFO queue, and then we have a while loop while the queue is not empty. What we do here is we remove the, the least recently added node, which is simply the remove operation on a FIFO queue, and we print its value. And then what we do is we add the nodes left and right children in that order to the FIFO queue. And you keep on doing this while the queue is not empty. Um, and notice here, there's obviously a condition where if the left or right child is null, you don't you don't want to add it to the queue, right? Um, but this is this is the basic. Um, these are the basic steps for a level order traversal of a binary search tree. So let's see the code for this, right? Um, we have our FIFO queue here, which is um, using Java's linked list representation um, with the queue. Um, reference. Um, and it's just a queue of nodes, right? Because we're adding nodes to this queue, left child, right child, all of that. Um, and what we first do before the while loop is we add the root node to the queue, you know, assuming the root is not null. Um, and then while the queue is not empty, um, we simply remove the least recently added um, node which you can simply use the remove operation here. You print out the value of that node, and then you add the left child and then the right child in that order, um, as long as neither of them are null, right? You don't want to add a null element to the, the queue. So as long as uh, you, add, you add the left child if it's not null, and then you add the right child if it's not null. And these are the exact steps listed on this slide here. And you'll notice um, that, you know, why this works is you know, here you're adding three to the queue, then you're removing three, you're printing out its value, and you're adding its left child and its right child to the queue. And then you're removing, so now, then you're removing one, you're printing out one, and you're adding zero and two to the end of the queue. But you don't process zero and two next because you still have five on the queue before that. So then you process five, you print out five, and then you add four to the queue. So what you, what you actually see is that we're actually processing these elements in level order. Um, or an increase in distance um, of edges from the root node. Um, and if you, if you just want a little bit more intuition with this, um, there's a lot of good BFS traversal um, informational websites online that are useful for just general BFS um, traversals of, of graphs. So I, I recommend to take a look into that. But again, this, this, is, this is the code for that. Um, it, it basically traverses the binary search tree in level order and it all works out pretty great. 
So there are some useful methods um, when you're dealing with binary search trees. One of them is finding the depth of a node. So if you remember when we were searching for nodes, it actually took time proportional to um, the depth of the node. And so we're gonna exploit that in order to find what the depth of a given node is. So what you do is you search for the node um, and while you're searching for the node, you're incrementing a counter variable that starts from zero every time a new level is reached. And you know, when is a new level reached? Well, it's it's every time a new edge is traversed, right? Because whenever you whenever you um, traverse an edge in a binary search tree search, um, each time you're following a left link or a right link, which is going down one level. And so you're actually you're actually calculating the depth um, at the same time as the search. Um, with this method. And so it's it's very useful. It's very intuitive. Um, you'll see here, you start up the current depth at zero. Um, then you use your, your iterative search um, solution here. Um, the only difference being, um, you'll see, uh, if, 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 you're, if you have a search hit, you return the current depth. Um, and then here, you always, you, you increment the, the depth by one every time you move to either a left link or a right link. So what happens is you start from zero. Um, you know, if the value you're looking for is less than the current node's value, you take a left link, otherwise you take the right link. Um, and then um, if you take a left link or a right link, that means you just increased your depth in the binary search tree by one. So you should increment that variable. Um, this could have been a plus plus there, but anyways. And then whenever you find the value, that is the target value is equal to the current node's value, you just return the current depth found so far. Um, and then if you, obviously if you can't find the value in the tree, then there is no defined depth. We just return negative one in this case. So that the key thing here is that is noticing that every movement from one node to another during a search in a binary search tree results in depth increase of one. And so that, that's an, a very easy way to determine you know, what the depth of a given node is in the binary search tree. There's also a slightly more complicated um, version of this where you're actually finding the height of the tree. Um, and so you're not looking at the depth of an individual node. Now you're looking at the, the height of the whole tree. And so what is this? First, first let's talk about the height of an individual node. Um, so this is actually um, not it's not the same as the depth of the node. Remember, the depth of the node is the number of edges from the root to the node you're looking at. However, the height of a node is the length of the longest path from it to a leaf. Um, so now you're looking at, instead of going from top to bottom, you're, since the leaves are on the bottom, now you're looking at from bottom to, to top, right? So if we want to find the, so the depth of six would be two, right? You follow two lengths, one from eight to three, one from three to six but the height of six is actually one because it's the, the length of the longest path from node to leaf um, or the, the length, um, the longest number, the greatest number of edges from six to a leaf. Uh, and both of its leaves, um, the, the paths to both of its leaves have only one edge there. If you think about the height of node 10, um, the longest path has two edges to a leaf. Right, so you, you can think about height of being from the ground up. They can think about depth being from sea level downwards. Um, so that's the height of a node. Um, you'll notice that the height of a, if a leaf is actually zero because you don't have to take any edges from a leaf to get to a leaf, right? Um, and so now, we, now that we know the height of a node, um, what is the height of a tree? Well, it's simply the height of the root node. So that's the longest path from the root node to any leaf. Um, in this case, it looks like it's um, three, right? So you take eight to three, three to six, six to four, or you could take you know eight to 10, 10 to 14, 14 to 13. Those are just two examples. Um, so, so we have the height of a node and the height of the tree is just the height of the root node. So, so how do we determine the height of this um, node? Um, so this is a little bit more complicated than finding the depth of a node, right? Okay, so let, let's start from the root node, right? We want to find, we want to determine its left, the height of its left um, child and the height of its right child, right? Um, and we want to, we want to determine which height is the greatest because we're looking at 
the longest path from the node, the root node to a leaf. So whenever we're looking at, whenever we want to find the height of a given node, we want to take the, the higher, the maximum of the heights of the two um, children, and we want to add one, right? Because it's just one more link to get to uh, the parent. So we determine, so we have our get height method. It's, it'll start at the root. Um, we want to determine the left height. So we're going to call it again from the left um, child. We want to determine the right height. So we call it from current dot right. And then we want to determine what is the maximum of, the, of those two. And we just want to add one because we know that the height of eight is the maximum of the height of three and 10 plus one to get from you know eight to three or eight to 10, right? Um, and so this method, it'll, it'll, it'll keep on going downwards. Eventually it'll get to a leaf and the leaf's left height, because we set, if we say, if current is equal to null, we say return negative one. Our leaf's um, left child's height will be negative one and the leaf's right child's height will be negative one. So that means that um, the maximum, negative one and negative one, the maximum is just negative one. And then you add one to get the height of the leaf, which is um, zero, right? Because negative one plus one is zero. So this actually satisfies the condition where the height of the leaf is zero. And then when you when you backtrack upwards, then it all works out. You can follow the recursion tree um, and it, this logically makes sense. So we, we define the, the height of a, of a null node to be negative one so that its parent, which is a leaf, can have a height of zero when you add one. Uh, and then all just propagates upwards. Um, so that's how you find the height of a tree. Uh, just some other tips. Um, when you're approaching a tree problem in, in a, a UIL computer science uh, test, some of the tree problems are just straight up textbook problems where you can just, um, you know, simply just remember how pre-order or post-order or you know level order whatever we, you just remember how it works and just code it in um, for example they might just say that you have a binary search tree insert these elements and print out the pre-order that's a that's an easier case um, but a lot of the times they they try to make it so that um, the tree implementation is hidden or it's not explicitly stated that you should use the tree right so the questions you want to ask yourself um, are as follows so you know, one is, you know, does the problem require some sort of hierarchical structure? You know, is there is there some sort of recursive structuring happen, happening here? Um, which might hint at, you know, a tree um, data structure. Um, and if, if there is some sort of hierarchical, hierarchical structure, um, maybe it's, it's only a slight change from regular binary search tree or a regular tree. Um, so in those cases, you don't want to just hard code, you know, how to code exactly a BST into your brain. You want to understand, you know, more of how it works. You know, you want to understand understand the structures and understand how you can accomplish certain operations um, because of its of its of the properties of its recursive structuring. So, you know, a problem might be not might not be just a regular binary search tree, but uh, a slight adaptation of it. And in that case. You really want to know how a binary search tree works so that you can adapt it to get your new solution, right? <clears throat> Another question you, um, you might ask yourself is, you know, do you really need to create a binary search tree to do this with explicit nodes and references, or can you possibly use a different technique that's easier to code or more intuitive, right? Um, a lot of the times you might be, you might want to rush into a binary search tree implementation when you actually don't need to you know, write out all the nodes and references. You could possibly use a different data structure that might be more efficient or just easier to code. Um, so that's something, something to definitely think about. Um, so then say, say you do wanna code a, a tree problem here. Um, some of the things you wanna ask yourself um, are, uh, what does each node represent in the problem? Maybe each node represents a person um, and a family or something else. Um, Maybe each node represents some destination in the map. Um, what are the connections between nodes? What do, they, what do they represent? How are they being represented in the problem? You know, if, if the nodes are people, are the connections between nodes, you know, parent, actual parent-child relationships? Or if the nodes are destinations, you know, what are the connections between nodes? Are there are they paths or roads between destinations? Um, so think about think about these very carefully because they're gonna define how you go about solving the problem.
And then once you do go about defining the node class, you want to make sure that it has all the instance variables that you will possibly need for the output at the end of the program. Likely, just building the binary search tree will, will only be the, the first step in the problem. There'll be something else that you have to calculate based on um, you know, the structure of the binary search tree. And the binary search tree might, might make it a little bit easier to determine those, those quantities. But in order to determine those quantities, you may have to record some values in <clears throat> each node in the binary search tree. And you might have to update, the, update those values as you're inserting into the binary search tree or something else. So that's something to keep in mind for sure. Um, then, you know, once, it, once you have all your structure set up, all you need to do is iterate over the input data, load up the binary search tree, and then apply whatever method um, or traversal you need to solve the problem. And then, of course, we always have the, you know, Wagner High School UIL Computer Science GitHub repository, um, which is, you know, an excellent resource to consult when you need help understanding how to go about solving a problem, um, or you want maybe want to find out a different way of solving a problem that um, might help you in, in future competitions, or it, it just has a lot of different programs to look at um, and to practice that you can be in tip-top shape for. Um, your hands-on component of the UIL computer science competition. All right, so now we're going to get into some coding, um, some UIL programs that incorporate uh, some of the concepts we'll be talking about. Um, so yeah, let's get into it. Okay, so here are the programs that we're going to be looking at. Um, they're from an A-plus uh, programming packet. Um, some of the problems we're going to be looking at are um, kind of like textbook, uh, binary search tree problems, and then we'll look at a couple of other problems that kind of relate to trees and recognizing those hierarchical structures. Okay, let's start off with PR140, <clears throat> post order. The problem is um, given a string, create a binary tree with the letters, add them in order left to right. Um, duplicate letters should go left. Okay, um, and then the input is a the first number in the data file represents the number of data sets to follow, and then each data set will consist of a word in all caps. Um, now what you notice is it just says binary tree, and so you might think that you just add the um, characters kind of in a level order fashion, um, but if you actually test out the input and output, um, say we take test, right? So say we take test, if we try to just do that left to right, like you might think it wants us to do um, with just a regular binary tree, uh, this is what we would get. And if you run the post-order traversal on this, um, what you actually get is test. Um, and you could obviously use your traversal tree here, just real quick. Um, you get that, backtrack. Yeah, so we would get a test if we if we did the, the post order traversal on this, even though our sample output wants us to write T set. Um, and so you might think um, maybe it's asking us to actually put it in a binary search tree. And that is correct. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have that in the problem statement correctly. Um, but because if you put test in a binary search tree in that order from left to right, um, you get this, right? E is less than T. Okay, so remember, we're looking at test. We handle T, we handle E. Um, S is less than T, right? S, T. Um, but it's greater than E, so S actually goes here. And then T, remember, duplicate um, elements according to the problem should go left. So T will go to the left of the root, right of E, and right of S. And so this is our binary search tree. And if we run the post order traversal on this tree, um, what we actually get is the following. Backtrack from T, back, backtrack from S, um, backtrack from E, and backtrack from T. And so you, now you get the, the proper sample output of T set. And so what they, what they actually want us to do in this problem is um, create a binary search tree from the letters by adding those letters to the binary search tree in order from left to right. 
Um, and so, and then, and then after we do that, we just need to print out the post order. And we already know how to do that from the presentation. So what I did this time, instead of, um, I didn't want to waste too much time doing the code, doing the coding um, live. Uh, so what I did is I pre-coded these programs and I'm just going to walk through what I did so that you can understand how to go about solving these problems. Um, so this is PR140. Um, we always start from the main method. I just have my scanner, which reads in uh, the input file that has this data in it. Um, obviously, we're scanning the number of cases, number of test data sets. And then for each of those um, cases, what we'll do is we'll scan in the next line as a char array. So I'll have each character in its own position in a character array. Um, then what I'll do is I actually made the PR140 class represent a binary search tree. And so this is this is a typical way to, to go about um, solving these problems in the UIL computer science contest. Um, just have whatever the, the program, if you need a binary search tree, have whatever the program's name, um, have that be the binary search tree object. So if your class name is PR140, have that be the binary search tree object so that you can just write a static inner class called node. Um, and you have your classic uh, left and right pointers. Um, in this case, I'll also store, uh, the value will be the, a character that I call letter. Um, that'll be useful when I'm doing the post order traversal and I wanna access what letter the node corresponds to. I also have this um, constructor method here, obviously, so I can just create a node with the letter and be done. And then because PR140 represents a binary search tree, I obviously have my um, private instance variable root, which is a node object. Um, and so here I just have, um, you know, the classic, uh, the most the most basic construction of the binary search tree over there. Um, because I'll, and because I have to add, okay, so before that, um, what I do is I have a constructor um, for PR140 that takes in this um, array of characters, um, and that is right here. And what this uh, constructor essentially does is it just adds each of these characters to the binary search tree, right? So for each character and what I scanned in for that test data set, I just have a method called insert letter that will insert that character into the binary search tree, right? And this insert letter is the same um, sort of method that we discussed in the presentation, right? We have, uh, remember with our insert letter, with the insertions in binary search trees, they're not as simple as the searches, right? So this is the case where we have to recursively rebuild the tree on the way downwards when we're inserting. So we're gonna need a, um, a regular insert letter method. And then, um, we're going to need our recursive insert method. Um, and notice that you, you could have obviously moved this uh, into here, um, but I just decided to keep it, um, you know, very standards so that um, this, this is a format you can always use when you're trying to code the insertion method. So we have our insert letter, sets the root to the recursive version, starting from the root, and we give it the letter. And here's just the code we discussed in the presentation. Um, remember, if we come across a null link, we just return a new node of the letter. So we construct a new, load, a new node with the value of letter. Um, remember, if letter is less than or equal to current.letter, we go left. If it's um, greater than, we go right. Um, notice that we do less than or equal to because the program states that duplicate letters should go left. Um, and then that's really the only consideration there. So now that we have that out of the way, we constructed the binary search tree, we have our insert methods. Um, now what do we want to do? Well, we simply want to, um, we want the post order traversal of the binary search tree. And this is a very simple method that you should have um, remembered. Um, uh, you start from the, the root node. Um, if you come across a null node, then there's nothing to do there. Otherwise you traverse the left tree, then the right tree, and then you print out the contents. Remember, post means you're printing out after you traverse the left and right subtrees. If we're doing a pre-order traversal, you print out the contents of the node before you traverse the left and right subtrees. And then of course, if you're in order, you, you traverse the left subtree, and you print out the node's contents, and then you traverse the right subtree. Um, but because we're doing a post order, we'll traverse left, then right, and then print out the letter of the current node. Um, so that's classic post order traversal. Um, so if you go back to the main method, all we did was 
um, just to recap, we scan in each line, uh, turn it into a, an array of characters. Um, we add each of those characters to the binary search tree with the class uh, of the program representing the binary search tree and it having a static inner class for the node representation. Um, and then we simply call our post order method starting from the root. And then we'll, we just have this print line method so that uh, we can move to the next line for different data sets. That's all this post order um, program is about. So PR140 was a pretty straightforward textbook problem. Um, there shouldn't be any issues here. Then we move on, move on to uh, PR141, which is pretty much the same thing. You'll see the, the program statement um, is, the problem statement is pretty much the exact same thing, except this time what we're doing is we are outputting the pre-order traversal instead of the post-order traversal. So what I just did is I copied the code from PR140, right? We have a node class. We construct the binary search tree using our insertion methods. Um, the only difference here is now instead of doing a post order, we'll be doing a pre order traversal. Um, and so what that just entails is, as I said before, because it's pre, you want to print out the contents of the node before you traverse the left subtree and right subtree. Um, so that's that's really the only trick there. Um, they just wanted a pre order traversal instead of a uh, post order traversal. Okay, so pretty pretty basic stuff so far. Um, we're all good, right? Just basic traversals. Um, now, what do we have to do? It's a little bit different now. So it says, the problem statement is, given a string, create a binary tree. Again, this is going to be a binary search tree um, with the letters. Add them in order from left to right, okay? Duplicate letters should go left, all right? An internal node is a node with one or more children, and an external node is a node with zero children. So remember, what is a node with zero children? And another word for a node with zero children is a leaf, right? So the number of external nodes is the number of leaves in the binary search tree. And every other node that's not a leaf will be an internal node because an internal node has at least one child. Um, so that's, okay, so the input is the, the first number in the data file represents the number of data sets to follow, all right? And then each data set will consist of a word in all caps. Okay, so it uh, looks like what we're gonna have to do is just as before, we'll scan in these lines, we'll add each one to its own binary search tree. Uh, and for each test case, what we need to do is, instead of running a traversal, what we need to do is, um, or instead of printing a, a classic traversal, what we'll need to do is we'll need to go through all the nodes in the binary search tree and determine for each node if it's an internal node or an external node, and we need to increment the appropriate counters. <clears throat> so let's see about how we should go about this. Um, so just as before, it's kind of the same manner here, right? Um, maybe I should zoom in for, for y'all if that makes it a little bit easier to see. Um, again, we just go through each line. We turn each line into a, an array of characters. Um, we Here, I'm just doing the same thing with constructor. I'm constructing the binary search tree, um, character by character from left to right. Um, and so now once we, once we construct the binary search tree, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to loop through all of the nodes in some fashion, right? Because we need to, we need to determine for each node, if it's, if it's an internal node or if it's an external node, right? So here I just have this method I called generic traversal. Uh, I didn't name it pre-order traversal or post-order traversal because any traversal that loops through all the nodes in the binary search tree is sufficient, right? We're not looking for a specific order of the nodes. Um, we're simply looking for the number of external nodes and the number of internal nodes from all nodes in the tree. So we just need some traversal that will loop through all of the nodes in the tree. Um, in this case, what we'll do is, um, this is kind of like a pre-order traversal I have over here. Um, remember, we're not trying to print any of the, the contents of the nodes out, but I'm going to process the node before I traverse the left and right subtrees. Um, so this is kind of following the pre-order traversal pattern. But any any um, traversal, even like a level or a traversal that goes through all the nodes would work here. So what I'm doing is, obviously if I come across a null node, there's nothing nothing to do there, right? Um, and so then when I'm processing a node, I want to determine if it's an internal node or an external node. Um, if it's an internal node, the condition I have here, that means that either um, the left one is not null or the right one is not null. 
So here I have current dot left. If current dot left is not equal to null, or current dot right is not equal to null, which means at least one of the children is non-null, then I increment the num internal pointer. Um, why is that? Because if one of the children is non-null, then the current node contains um, at least one child. And so it's an internal node by definition. So in that case, I increase the num internal variable, which I simply have over here as an instance variable. Um, otherwise, that means that, um, you know, the negation of this is that means that both the left child and the right child are null. And in that case, um, that is a leaf in the binary search tree. So we can increment the num external variable. And um, this whole traversal is just pretty much a pre-order pre traversal. It'll go through all the nodes in the graph. We'll, we'll be able to calculate these conditions for each node. Um, and so this should calculate the, um, the number of nodes, uh, number of internal nodes and number of external nodes in the tree. And I forgot that I haven't, I didn't run these programs for you um, with PR140 traversal. Let me just run this program. You'll see that it generates the, um, the same output that we want um, over here. All right, we have TSET, ARY, and IB. You can check the rest. Um, it's all good. Um, I'll just do the same thing for PR141 real quick. Um, you can see test, bain read, branch, it's all the same. Um, and then coming to the problem that we're currently working on, PR142, if we run PR142, um, we get the same output that we desire. Um, and so this, this program um, obviously works. Um, it's, it's very simple. All we need to do is um, use some traversal that goes through all the nodes in the tree in order, and then for each node, determine if it's an internal node or an external node by looking at its children pointers. Um, and from there, it's pretty easy. Um, so once we uh, update these num internal and num external variables at the end of the while loop, um, we can simply print out those values, just as the sample output wants. Okay, so that's PR142. Um, PR143 is another um, textbook problem, which is one of the harder textbook problems, and that's calculating the height of the binary tree, or the binary search tree. Um, but we did go over this in the presentation, so it shouldn't be too bad. Um, problem statement is, given a string, create a binary search tree with letters, add them in order left to right. Duplicate, duplicate letters should go left. Um, the height of a tree is the distance from the head to the deepest node. And remember, when we're talking about the distance, we're talking about the number of edges, right? So we're talking about the number of edges between or from the head or the root to the deepest node in the tree, which is a leaf, right? Um, and then the input is the first number in the data file represents the number of data sets to follow. And then each data set will consist of a word in all caps. Okay. And then we want to output the height of the binary tree. Okay. And then we have this assumption where a tree with only a head has a height of zero. That makes complete sense given the definition we reviewed in the presentation um, because you wouldn't require any number of edges to get from the root to the leaf, which are the same node. Okay, so I think it's gonna be this pretty much the same procedure to start off with. Um, this is PR143. The same procedure to start off with, we just have to scan in each case. We have to um, use our insertion method to insert the characters into the binary search tree. The only difference now is instead of running traversal, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to use our height calculation method. Um, and so uh, here I have this um, method called get height starting from the root. It's the same method we discussed in the presentation. Remember if we're at a, uh, if we're at the child of a root of a leaf, if we're at the child of a leaf, we return negative one. Otherwise we get the left height or the height of the left subtree of the current node and then the height of the right subtree of the current node. We determine the maximum of those two and then add one to get the height of the current node. Um, obviously this is a recursive structure. It starts from the root, goes all the way downwards and then rebuilds itself on the way up. Um, uh, if you want to you know, trace this out or, or go back to the presentation to review how that works, um, we can definitely go ahead and do that. But we know that this makes intuitive sense um, if we calculate the, the height of the left subtree and the height of the right subtree, and we want to find the height of the current node, 
we just add one to the maximum of, the, of these two because we're looking for the longest path from the root node to a leaf. Um, and then of course the negative one here um, was again from, uh, if, we're at, if we're a child of a leaf, we want to return negative one so that the leaf can be defined to have a height of zero, just as we would like. Um, and as, as is defined in, in, in the, the definition of height, right? Um, so that, that's the program, that's the that's code for, for getting the height. If we run this, we can see that it works perfectly fine. 344, 546, 344, 546. Um, so that works great. The next problem, we'll skip PR144 um, and we'll go to PR145. So this is uh, quite a bit different than the previous problems we looked at. Um, this is not a binary search tree problem, um, but it does have some sort of hierarchical structure that we can draw um, intuition from, um, from binary search trees in order to solve this problem. Um, okay, so we have the problem statement is family trees are an important method of describing ancestry. Um, you're to create and print a family tree based on known relationships between people. The tree will only contain parent and child relationships and a person can only have one parent. Okay, so um, we're going to be given relationships, given parent-child relationships um, between people, um, and then a person can only have one parent. So this looks a lot like a tree, right? Um, it's not a, it's not a binary search tree because um, there there is no no ordering defined here, right? And there's no need for any ordering. We just we just care about you know is this a child of something else? Is that a parent of some child? Um, so we'll get into this here in the input. It'll explain it a little bit more. It says the first line will contain a single letter M that indicates the number of data sets that follow. Um, each data set will begin with an integer describing how many relationships are in a tree. Um, again, these relationships are parent-child relationships. Um, and then each relationship will exist on its own line. Um, the allowed relations are A parent B, so A is a parent of B, A child B, A is a child of B. Um, so again, if we come across A parent B, A is a parent of B, um, and we can read A child B the same as B parent A. Um, so that's something we'll use in the code just to make it easier. Okay, so we have the output as we want to output the family tree. Children should be sorted alphabetically. Okay, so let's look at what's happening here. We want a family tree for each of these three test cases. Um, here we have the number of relationships for that family tree. A is a parent of B, C is a parent of D. All right, and then here we, we, we are just putting that into this kind of graphical representation or visual representation. Because A is a parent of B, B is has this little annotation below A, and then um, C and D are not related to A and B by any means. So um, C or D do, do not fall under any indentations of A. So C starts a new, new subtree kind of um, and then D is obviously the child of C, so it's in C's indentation. Um, so hopefully this makes sense. Um, this problem is made a little bit easier by the fact that a person can only have one parent. So say B, B is a child of A over here, right? Um, we don't have to print, if, if A was the father of B um, and B also had a mother, then we'd have to worry about printing the father and mother and then printing um, B in, in the indentation. But luckily we don't have to worry about that case. Okay, so let's go to the program that I coded for this one. Um, it's probably a little bit, uh, there's, 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 there's several ways you can, you can go about solving this program, but I thought this way was really interesting because it combined um, several interesting data structures that uh, might be useful for you in future programs. Um, obviously, there's, there's many ways to go about solving this problem. Um, if you remember from the presentation, um, one of the questions was, do you really need a binary um, search tree or can you use some other data structure that might make it a little bit easier or might be more intuitive? And so in this case, I'm not going to actually um, code any sort of tree, um, but the data structures I do code will kind of internally um, represent a tree. Um, just because I think handling the nodes and making the trees and everything um, with this sort of problem might be a little bit um, more complicated. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use an explicit tree. It's going to be implicit. So what I'm going to do here is I scan through the PR145 um, text file um, for each data set. What I'm going to do is I'm going to store the parent-children relationships. So this will link a parent to its children, um, keeping in mind that a parent might have multiple children. So each parent, which is a string, will link to a tree set of children. Why did I use tree set? Because it, it pretty much wants children to be printed in, um, if there are multiple children, it wants them to be printed in alphabetical order. Um, uh, you'll also notice here, it looks like if there are multiple subtrees within that family tree, or within that family forest almost, um, you want to print that in alphabetical order as well. But we'll get into that. That's that's why I'm using uh, tree maps, just so I can handle all of that up front. I don't need to worry about sorting anything later. Um, so again, I have this this um, tree map that links from parent to from a parent to all of its children. And so then I have this variable here called relationships. And what and what this does is, um, if you think about parent to children, it doesn't like really define recursively or hierarchically in any way, right? We're just listing all of the the parents and the children. Um, of those parents. But I also need some way to, you know, could, because this is uh, some sort of hierarchical structure, um, I can't just list, you know, a parent as child because the parent might be a child of another um, person, right? So what I do with, with relationships is, uh, in this variable, it's almost like um, we can research what um, a union find um, data structure is. Union find and data structures are, are really useful for some problems, but I'm, I'm kind of drawing some um, influence from there. Um, what this relationships variable will do is it'll tell me what the parent, um, it'll tell me what the parent of each node is. So I might know that, um, you know, A is the parent of Q, but A is also the child of G. And so I can, I'll exploit this relationship later, you'll see, um, and it'll become pretty nice. Um, and this is just for keeping track of, you know, children of children of children or um, things like that. Um, okay, so here I have the number of relationships that I have to scan through. Um, while I still have lines to scan for this test case, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to process the line as a as a, an array of strings separated by white space. So the first element will be um, the letter or the string. The second element will be the parent or child relationship. And the B will be the second um, person in the relationship. Okay, so, um, and we want to handle, you know, different cases for if we're talking about the parent or child. Um, but I just, I want to keep the methods for inserting the, into these um, data structures the same. Um, so you'll see how I, I switch up things down below, um, depending on if we're talking about parent or, or child. So if we're talking about a parent relationship, if the if uh, next line of one equals parent, um, what do I want to do? Well, I want to insert this into the parent to children tree map, right? So if that tree map already contains um, the parent, then I'm just going to get its children list or its children tree set and add a new child to it. Otherwise, if the tree map doesn't contain the parent yet, I want to add this to the tree map. So I'll put the parent, remember, notice I'm using get here and then adding to the list, but here I'm using put because I want to insert um, a new entry. So if, if the parent doesn't already exist in the parent to children tree map, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that parent in and it's going to initialize with a set um, containing one element and that element being the child um, from that entry in the input data set. And this is just a quick way of doing that part in one line. Um, I just insert a new tree set and inside of the um, inside of the parentheses, just as you can do with an array list, I just say arrays.as list. I put this in there, it'll turn that into a tree set. So this will be a tree set of one element. Um, so that handles that part. What about the relationships variable? So remember the, the relationships variable is, is storing the immediate parent. Um, so if the relationships, if, it, if, if the variable doesn't already contain the parent, um, then what we want to do is we want to put in the parent 
and the parent again. This is basically saying that um, this has no parent. Um, if we have to insert it for the first time, it, it at, at default at default each um, we cannot assume that a, a node has a parent, right? Um, so, for example, when we have a parent B, um, we can assume that B's parent is A, but we, we cannot assume that A has a parent. So what we'll do is we'll make A's parent point to itself. Okay, so we're just gonna insert the parent twice. However, um, so that, that just handles that part there um, for the parent. But we do know for sure that the child's parent, so next line of two, is next line of zero. So we do know that, that the, the child's parent um, is this. So we can insert that relationship into the tree. But um, again, over here, um, we do, if, if, the, if, the, if the relationship's variable does not contain the parent yet, we just make the parent point to itself because we, we don't know um, that A has any parent yet, for example, here. Um, it might not have any parent. And this will be useful um, when we get into actually printing the tree. Um, because you'll see that we can keep on following the line up until we find um, an, a, a person that doesn't have any parent. And we know that that person would start the family tree, right? So it's going to be useful for us. Um, and then in this else case over here, we actually have the, the case where instead of it being parent, we actually have the child. And so this is pretty much the same thing as before, um, but instead of uh, us thinking about D being the child of C, we're thinking about C being the parent of D. Um, so we're just gonna be switching basically wherever we have next line of one, we'll change it to, or whenever, wherever we have next line of zero, we'll change it to next line of two. Um, and wherever we have next line of two, we'll change that to next line of zero. So again here, um, if we already, if we, if our parent and children already contains the parent, which is this time next line of two, then we're just gonna get the parents' ch children list and we'll add the child, which is next line of zero. Otherwise, if the parent children uh, map doesn't contain the parent already, we'll put it in um, with its child. If, if the relationships variable contains, already contains the parent, or if it doesn't contain the parent yet, we'll set the parent of the parent to itself, um, right, just as before. Uh, because def we default to um, saying the parent to itself because we cannot be sh we don't know if the parent already has a parent um, and notice that if it, it, the next line of two might actually have a parent in relationships and if that's the case then it would already contain the key and so you wouldn't set the parent back to itself right um, and then really we set the parent uh, the child appropriately and th this will make a lot more sense if you read an article on um, uni union find data structures. Um, they're very useful. They can keep track of these hierarchical relationships for you. Um, so you can easily find, they're, they're very useful for finding the root element uh, in the hierarchical structure. So here I'm storing the, the parents of, of each person. And so using the union find data structure, it's very easy to determine um, which is like the root or which are the roots of all other elements or what, what what do all other elements eventually distill down to like from s it's it's the child of this which is the child of this it all distills down to g right um g um made all of these elements eventually or all of these or g is the ancestor of all other people here um so that it makes it very easy to define the 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 oldest ancestor or the root of these family trees. But yeah, just go ahead and look up. Um, union find data structure is very useful. So anyways, now that I have these parent to children, I know the children of each parent in the tree, and I know um, I know what the parent of each person is. Okay, so that, that's what I know so far. Um, from that, I can get the roots, right? Why do I wanna get the roots? Um, well, I wanna print out I need to print out the tree starting from the root, right? If G, if uh, I can't, I can't start this tree from A with no indentation because it's the child of G. It, sh it should be under G. I need to find that that one or more roots. Um, in this case, it's one root um, where everything else will go underneath it. 
Um, but there, in, in this case, there's actually multiple subtrees or trees in this forest of, of, um, of trees. Um, A and B are, are independent from C and D. And so in this case, we have multiple roots or multiple people that don't have any parents. And we, well, we want those to be printed um, without any indentation because they start new trees, right? Um, so what I do here is I want to get the roots of the trees um, that I need to draw out here. And I use my get roots method, which takes in the relationships variable. Okay, so let's go to get roots. So it takes in the relationships variable that shows what the parent of each person is, right? And it'll contain all of the people in the in the input data file, um, you know, once you scan through all of these. So um, in order to determine the roots, um, we go through each person in that, um, in this tree map, and we say, um, if, if the, if the parent of that person is itself, that means that it is a root of a, of a tree. Um, and how do we determine that? If, if, um, if we get the, the, the parent of the, of the person we're looking at, so relationships not get person that should return the parent the way we set it up. If that's equal to the person itself, that means the person doesn't have any parent, then that means it's a root of a family tree. And so we're going to add this person to the roots because we want it to start a new tree. Um, so we do that. If there are multiple roots, they get added to this roots list. Um, otherwise, the roots list just contains one element, and then we return that back. So at this point, we know um, we know the children of each parent. We know what the parent of each person is. And we also know the roots that start the trees. And so now from this, it's much easier to think about constructing this um, family tree because for each root, what we'll do is I have this method called print family tree that um, it'll take in the parent of children, it'll take in the root or the current node, and then it'll has, it has zero there. So what, what, what do these represent? So I have the parent of children uh, data structure. I have the parent that's going to represent pretty much like the current node that we're looking at. Then I have this um, int uh, level. Why do I have level? Because as I go deeper into the family tree, I need to write more underscores, need to increase the indentation. Um, so this just keeps track of that for me. Okay, so I start at one of the roots, right? So I start at one of the roots of the tree. Say I'm looking at this tree, I start out with G. Um, I print out the appropriate number of underscores before G um, because I, I called it um, with the root and zero. It's not going to print any underscores in this for loop, which is what I want. Um, and then I'll print out the character or the person, which is the parent. And then what I'll do is um, parent to children dot get parent. So this is getting the children the children of the parent. If it's null, if the if the uh, parent has no children, then there there's nothing else to do, right? Um, it's just a single element there. We don't we don't have to keep on going deeper into the tree. Um, otherwise, if it has children, we do need to go deeper into the tree. And so what we'll do for each of the children in it, its child list, um, which we can get from parent to children. Um, what we do for each of those children is um, we we recall this recursive method from the child, adding another level. So what will happen is. You know, from the root, we print out G, then we'll call this recursive method um, um, with the, with each child. So if, if G has one child, as it does here, um, we call it with A. Then what A would do was is it's going to call it again with with A's children. Um, and so as you can see here, um, that this is where that pair of children list comes in. So we use the relationships list to determine what is the you know, the most fundamental root of each family tree. You know, uh, here we have B point A and then D point C. These are completely separate. Here, um, the ancestor of all of these people is G and G has no parent, so it should be the root, right? It should start off the tree. So relationships is simply finding out um, which, which um, nodes or which people should be the roots um, of the family tree or the root of the family tree, depending on your test case here.
parent and children, once you determine, once you, once you start it off from the root, then you can determine what, what is the child of this person and what is the child of this person and what is the child of this person recursively. Um, and so this actually will print out the family tree correctly as we see if we run this. Um, let me just take this up. You see we have the same output that's desired, GAQ, BFS, JCSF. And notice that um, when we're calling this recursive method, because we pass in level plus one, our underscores are always working correctly. Because whenever we, um, whenever we, whenever we're calling the method for a child, we know that we're going to have to include an extra underscore from whatever is currently being used. So we just increase level by one, and everything works out um, very good over here. So this is kind of the the structure I used for um, this problem. Um, it's it's deviating quite a little bit from what we were talking about, but um, I hope it just expands your view of. Um, these sort of hierarchical tree structures and how you don't have to stick to, you know, strictly coding out nodes and connections. You can actually rely on other data structures that implicitly represent these relationships. Um, and it, there's there's obviously a ton of ways to go about solving this problem, but um, I think that the main, the main um, goal of this one is to um, really understand um, that you can use other data structures to represent the same thing. Um, and I think you should also really look into the uni unifying data structure that's kind of being used over here um, to determine what the roots of each tree are. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and take a look at that um, on your own time. Okay, let's move on to the final problem, which is PR147. Um, again, it's not actually um, directly related to binary search trees, um, but it is that sort of tree problem that has some sort of hierarchical structure that um, that we've been um, already dealing with. Um, and so we should be able to draw these um, concepts from binary search trees in order to solve these new problems. So let's take a look at PR147. A tri is a data structure that is more time optimized than a binary search tree that requires more memory and only works for specific cases. Okay, in a tri, each node in a each node has children for any possible character. Um, for example, in a string try, the root node would have a node for every letter A through Z. If the word you were searching for started with the B, you would move to the B node and so on until you reach the final letter in your search. Okay, inserting a key into the try traverses down the tree, adding nodes until the word is fully spelled. Um, the final node in the word should be marked as the end of the key for retrieval purposes. Okay, sounds sounds good here. So, let's let's think about what a try is. Um, this is actually pronounced try, not tree. Um, we actually study this in our data structures and algorithms class. Um, but let's take a look at, at a try. Um, say, okay, so in this case, obviously we have for every letter a through z. Say our alphabet is only like three and say the alphabet is, hold on, let me switch back to black. Say our alphabet only has three letters, them being A, B, and C, okay? So in each try, or in, in a try, each node has children for any possible character. Okay, so we have this root node here and it'll have a child for every possible character. So because every possible character, you can only start um, the string off with A, B, or C, there's only gonna be three pointers here. One for A, one for B, one for C in that order. So we'll say that this is in, you know, the left um, link is A, the middle link is B, and the right link is uh, C. And so these will be three pointers to three nodes. And so taking a pointer from the root node to this new node means, so say you take um, this left pointer here, taking that pointer to this node means that your string starts with an A. Okay, so in a try, the information isn't contained in the node itself per se, it's contained in the, the edges, the links you take. So it's, it's all implicit. 
Um, if you take the left link, that means um, your your first word will start or your word will start with an A. If you take the middle link, that means your word starts with a B. If you take the third link, your word starts with a C. <clears throat> okay, and so um, this is recursively defined. So once you reach once you reach this node, let me just um, get rid of those. Once you reach this node, we know that it starts with an A. Um, say that the word is A B. Okay, say the word is AB. So this node actually also has three pointers, one for A, one for B, one for C. So we have all possibilities represented. Um, and if your word is AB, now you've already taken the A pointer from the root. Now that we handled A, you want to take the B pointer. So now you're going to take this middle link to get to here. And so arriving at this node here, means your word starts with a b because you took the a link from the root uh to here and then you took the b link from this node to this node um and so this is how a try a string try works you you process character by character going down um this try where each node has pointers to all possible characters you can continue from um obviously in, in, the, in the problem statement it says um you know, we could have every letter A through Z, that's 26 pointers. Um, I'm just drawing three pointers here so that we can, um, I can fit this on the page, right? But in, in the problem statement, we're actually gonna want 26 pointers somehow, okay? Let's think about the next sentence. If the word you were searching for started with the B, you would move to the B node and so on until you reach the final letter in your search. So now it's talking about searching. Um, Let's let's continue. Let's uh, finish this off because there is one sentence in here that's very important. Um, inserting a key to the try traverses down the tree, um, adding nodes until the word is fully spelled out. So here we discussed how we added a b. Let, let me just discuss one other. Okay, say say we add um, c a b. Okay, so how do we insert c a b into the the string try? Well, we start from the root node. We have to take this left. Um, or this right corner here, which corresponds to um, the C link, right? And we arrive at that node, which corresponds to have having taken um, the C link. So we know that it starts with a C. So we've, we've handled C. Um, then what do we do? Hold on here. Okay, so we've handled the C. Now the second letter in the, in the string is an A. Now again, this node, it's recursively defined. So the try is recursively defined. So at this node, well, we have another three pointers um, for, you know, our, for taking either A, B, or C um, for the next letter in the word or the key. Um, so the next letter in the, in the key is A, right? So we'd actually take that left pointer, which represents A, we take that to this node. So arriving at this node means that we our word starts with C A. Okay, that's perfectly fine. And then we move on to the last character, which is B. And so again, this node has three pointers: um, one going to A, one going to B, one to one to C. Now we want to take the B pointer and insert a new node there, which represents the word starting with C. A and then B. So now we've exhausted all of the letters in the string or the key. If you notice here in the problem statement, it says the final node in the word should be marked as the end of a key for retrieval purposes. Say you wanted to see if the word cab existed in your um, string try. Well, what you do is you start from the node, you take the C link. Um, let me just do this in a different color. You start from the node. Um, you take the C link, um, you take the A link, and, um, oops, looks like I accidentally, um, let's see, it looks like I accidentally put our B node there in the C. So that, that's actually uh, taking the B node at the end, right? So we take the C node. 
we took the A node, or the C link, we took the A link, and then we took the B link. Okay, so this is actually the node that we want to arrive at when we're inserting cab. Okay, so now we're searching for cab. That's my fault. Now we're searching for cab, and um, so we take the C link, we get there, we take the A link, we get there, and then we take the B link, and we get here. Right? Um, and so, uh, how do we know that cab um, was inserted to the tree? How do we um, know that it wasn't, um, you know, cabby, for example? Or um, if we're stick if we're sticking to this uh, three-letter alphabet, how do we know the word was not cabba? Because this could also have, you know, three other links, um, and it, there could be another one here which would represent um, cab. So how do we know that cab is the string that exists in the try and not some other string? In a similar way, you know, how do we know that, um, say we were looking, we're trying to determine if CA exists. Well, surely there are non-null non nodes on that path in, in, the, in the try, but that's only because um, we use those nodes to construct cab. Um, there, we didn't insert CA at any point. So the way we solve this, as is said here, it says the final node in the word should be marked as the end of the key for retrieval purposes. So in this cab, um, C, A, B, this node over there, we need to mark it somehow. And so in that node, we'll have some type of um, you know, data type, say a Boolean, and we can say Boolean, you know, is last. And we can set that equal, equal to true. Okay. And so now if we're searching for a, a string, we search for the string, we get to the last character, and then we see in that node is the is last variable true. And if it is, that means the key exists in the string. Otherwise, it means that, um, it's just in, an internal node, which means um, there is no string key that ended there, right? So that, that, that's what that's saying. In this problem, um, it actually doesn't matter, um, but in a general string try, you wanna keep that in mind. You wanna mark off that last node um, that you've inserted for a given key. Okay, so now we can backtrack to, if the word you were searching for started with the B, we would move to the B node and so on until you reach the final letter in your search. Um, we kind of went over that scenario here. So say we're looking for AC. Um, so what would we do? We would start from the root. Well, we would want, if, if AC existed in the tree, then we'd follow the A link. And if AC existed in the tree, the next link we'd follow would be the C link. But we notice that there's nothing there, and so that key does not exist in the tree. Um, if there was something there, then we'd obviously would check the is last variable to make sure it's true, in which case we did add that string to the try. Okay, so that's, that's how a string try works. Um, you might not be able to understand all of that from, from this problem statement. Um, it is a tiny bit vague, um, but, but this, is, this is the general structure of, of a try. And it does match up with, with, the, um, um, with all of the statements of the, of the problem statement. So, um, Yes. Um, the only thing that you need to watch out for is this problem statement doesn't say anything about how you represent the try. So that's really up to you as the programmer, right? Um, now, in general, what you do with the with the string try for, for its representation is, let me write this out. <clears throat> so in general, you'll, you'll have a node class. So this will be your node. And you'll have a pointer from that node to each letter in your alphabet, or each possible letter that you could have next, right? In this case, it was three nodes. Um, but, you know, this letter could be, like in the problem statement, it could be for each letter A through Z. So you could have 26 pointers, and you don't want to hard code, hard code each of those pointers into the node class, because it's not um, efficient, right? What you want to instead do is you want to make an array. So with this node, I'm just gonna kind of list it like this. This is kind of the node structure. You'll have a, um, 
you'll have an array of, of pointers. And so um, for each node, uh, you, you know, when you construct that static interclass, you're gonna, you're gonna make an array of um, node pointers that'll go to the next letter in the string or the next possible letter in the string. And so, um, you know, in this case, we'd, we'd create an array of like three, um, but, or because it's such a small number, you could just write out, you know, the three links um, separately. But in this case, since you have A through Z, you're gonna make, um, you can't just write out all of those variables. You'd have to have 26 variables, right? Um, but in this case, you could just make an array of length 26. And so each element in that array would correspond to a different link being taken um, because this array is an array of nodes. The way this works is you want, you want some mechanism of, um, so that A maps to the first, A maps to zero, B maps to one, and C maps to two, right? Um, because if you have an array of length three, then you want it so that your letters are taking zero, one, and two individually. And if you had an array of length 26 to handle um, all of those characters, you'd want, you know, A to represent zero and, I don't know, Z to represent 25, right? So there, there are, there's an easy, easy way to do this. Um, but the, the most common way to do this is um, they want, they want the letters A through Z, okay? So if you think about the ASCII values, um, to cover, you know, to cover all the letters A through Z and a little bit more, you only need ASCII values up to 128. Um, if you want to cover the, the extended ASCII alphabet, you know, I think that's 255. There are 256 letters, but 0 to 255. So let me just write that again. So really what you could do is, instead of making an array of length 26 to handle all of the letters in the alphabet, you could create an array of length 128. And then what you could do is, because, because um, um, all of the, okay, so think about this, right? What is the character value? What is the ASCII value of A? It's 65, right? And if you go all the way to the ASCII value of Z, it'll be, you know, less than or equal to 127. It's less than 127. But it'll be less than or equal to 127. Um, and that even handles the lowercase variables. So we know lowercase Z is less than or equal to 127. Um, and you should, you should just know these things, right? Or you can... You could just start off with 65 and work your way up. Um, but the key thing here is to know that the the ASCII value of each of these characters that that we could um, want to put in this try, all of those ASCII values are within um, uh, zero to 127, right? And so what we can actually do there is we can just construct an array of 128 of length 128, and then whenever we want to determine which um, element or which index um, the, the pointer is being put into, we can simply calculate the ASCII value of the letter and just um, make a new node there. So for example, this is, say this is our root node and say we have a node array and it's up length 128. Then say we want to insert capital A, capital B, the string capital A, capital B, so app, right? Um, so what we want to do is, you know, instead of having A linked to zero, we can just create an array of like 128 and see what um, the ASCII value of A is and just insert a new node there. So what is the ASCII value of capital A? It's 65, right? So what you actually say is you'd access this, this array of 65 and then you'd insert a new node there. And having taken that node would mean that your string started with A. And so array of 65 um, is going to map to a new node. And so this node will also have an array 
of length 128. And then for B, B maps to, um, you know, 66, right? So here in this array, it'd be R of 66, and you'd have a new node there. And, and being at that node would represent your string starting with AB. And because our string ended at B, what you technically have to do is um, uh, you have to mark it off, right? You have to say, is last is true. Is last equals true. Okay, so this is how we're gonna do it. Um, instead, of, instead of using that, uh, instead of having A correspond to zero, and you know z correspond to 25 it's just i think it's 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 a bit easier you don't have to think about the math behind this you can just make an array of sufficient length um in this case 128 works fine um if you want to be safe in all cases um and handle like pretty much every string then you could have an array of length 256 because that covers the extended ascii alphabet um but we we only need the 128 um characters here and so we'll just have the character determine the index in the array that we're taking and it'll make it a lot easier for us um, when we're coding this try okay so now we know like you know what what a try is and how we might go about coding this in a program so what is the input the first number in the data file represents the number of words to insert into the try okay and words will follow to be inserted into the try and each word will consist only of uppercase letters Okay, so what we want to do is we just want to insert everything into a try. Now, what's what's the catch here? You know, what what's the hard part or the harder part? Um, we need to print the try, and the try should be traversed in level order. Um, it says each level should be arranged in alphabetical order, but what I, I think it what I think it's it's meaning is that um, um, for each possible you know node that you're taking, so say for example here we took both node A and C, we print, um, we'd actually print, uh, okay, so for here, like the level order traversal would be like A and then C. So I would, that would take care of this level and then we, we'd move on to the next level going left to right again. T um, and we just print out all the links that are being taken from left to right. I'm pretty sure that's what this means. Um, I think that's what um, each level should be arranged in alphabetical order means is that, um, you know, our node references are going from left to right in alphabetical order. Um, that is, uh, you know, A is before Z, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that's what that means. And yeah, so we want to traverse this try in level order. Okay. So we do know some, we do know some travel level order traversal um, code in our head. So that's good. Um, so let's start about, let's go about um, solving this problem, PI-147. Okay, so here we go. So we have to take in the number of test cases, and for each test case, we need to insert it into the try. Now notice, um, these are not actually test cases, these are the strings that are being inserted, inserted into the try, right? And so what actually happens here is we need to insert all of these strings into the same try. So I have this insert string, static method here um, that's going to insert um, our string into the try. Now this follows a, a similar kind of method to um, insertion into a binary search tree. That is, you can't just use your, your simple naive code. Um, you can't just edit, you know, your search method. You have to actually rebuild the, the tree or the try on the way downwards as you're inserting. Um, and so Let's, let's hold off on this for a bit. Let's see what my data structure is. So in PR 147, that represents the full try. I have this static inner class called node, and I have this variable is n, which represents, you know, if that node represents the end of a key or a string. You'll notice that that's not actually needed here because we're not searching for any keys, but I just put it there just for the sake of, you know, completeness. This is what you would do in, if you're actually coding to try. Um, but this is the important part here. I have my next array, which is a, an array of nodes, and it has 256 elements. So this is pretty much, um, it's covering all, pretty much all characters that um, the program could give us. Even though it says um, this is only for every letter A through Z, in general, um, 256 covers anything you could possibly need. Right. 
but obviously you could do the math and figure out how many um, elements you actually need to get to z right but here to say 256 it's a common value used um, so let's continue um, because pair 147 represents a try we have this and and we actually did this I actually did this statically in this case so it's not I'm not using um, um, I'm not using instance methods even though I could have um, but um, yeah I just decided to do it static for some reason um, so we have this static node root um, and this is this is gonna be the root node um, and then all other nodes will follow from it depending on um, what strings we insert into the try, right? Okay, so now we can get to this insert method. Uh, we use the same root is equal to the recursive method. Um, we give it a string. We also give it zero. Now, what, what is what is zero? If we look over here, it's the index. Um, now, why do we need this? Because as we insert, you know, when we're inserting a string into the try, we're processing it character by character, right? And so as soon as we determine which note to take, first then we have to move on to the next character in the string to determine which character to take next right so this index is going to keep track of which character we're currently on <clears throat> okay so how's this going to work um again if current is equal to null we'll return a new node that, that should be put there um basically what this means like um in the context of this drawing is when we're inserting a, a new node um we don't actually return a node. Notice we don't return a node. We just we set current equal to a new node. Um, so, for example, if we if we wanted to insert a new node here or a new string here, and it had to take this right link there right now, um, it doesn't point to any node, right? So then the node is actually null, and so we want to create a new node there. But we're not done, right? We still have to create more nodes after that um, to handle the rest of the string if there are more characters in the string. Another case would be we just need to mark that node as the last character in the string. Um, so we just create a new node for, for now. We don't, re we don't return the node yet. Okay, so here we handle the case if we're on the last, if we created that node and now we're on the last, um, the last uh, character of the string that we're trying to insert, then that means we should mark that node's isN variable as being true just for the sake of it, even though we don't use the isN variable. Um, then we return current because now you can actually return current because you're done. You're done with the with creating your nodes, right? And so this this would just go back up and, and recreate the tree on the way up. Um, otherwise, if you're not in the last character, you still have more characters to process, right? And so what you do is you look at the index that you're currently looking at. Notice it'll start at zero, right? Um, and so this this handles, for example, if your if your try is empty, and your root's null, then it'll create a new node for the root, and then it'll look at the first character of the string. Okay, so this already works looking at it like that like it um, that way. So we, we get the, the character at the index we're looking at, um, and then we say the current node's next array. Remember our, our array is called next. So we, we, we index straight into the array because next char will turn into the ASCII value of the character when you use it to index into an array like this. So it's basically finding its ASCII value and it's finding, and that's the index in the array. And over there, that's where we're gonna use, um, you know, our classic um, um, insertion re, um, recursive call. And so you're gonna, you're gonna set that equal to the recursive method of starting there again uh, and the same string but this time you're going to increment the index by by one so what's happening here right you you find you find the character that you're trying to process in the string um and you take that link and then from there you decide so in order to decide what links to take after that you increment the index by one and call it again with the recursive method and this is kind of like the same format as your classic insertion into a binary search tree, remember? Um, for example, one of the cases was current.left is equal to the recursive method of current.left and then the key, right? In this case, um, current.next of the, of the char that we're inserting at um, 
is equal to this, the recursive method of that same thing, um, but moving on to the next index in that string. Um, there is, if you might want to trace out the code on this to make sure that it's actually working correctly, um, just that you feel confident in this code. Um, you can think about starting off from a an empty try and then and then adding a new key to an existing try. You'll notice that this code will um, continue to work. Um, the main difference from a regular binary search tree um, insertion method is that now you have to think about um, which index you're looking at. You you have to you don't necessarily return the new node you create immediately because it you might have to mark it off um, or you might have to examine more characters in the string. And then here, instead of current.left or current.right, um, you're looking at the this node reference um, in the array, in the next array, incrementing index by one each time you process a different character. Um, so this is the insertion method for um, a try. Again, I, I highly recommend you go through this and really understand what's happening. Um, that's just something you have to do by yourself to really internalize um, you know, how this is going about inserting the string into the try. Um, but I think you should be able to get that um, relatively easy. Okay, so now what we've done is we've inserted all of these strings into the try. Okay, that's great. Now what we need to do is we need to print the try by doing a level order traversal. And I've discussed here what I think the level tra level traversal is getting at. Um, basically, what you're doing is, you know, going through each level, you're printing out the, um, you're basically printing out the, the edges you're taking. So, for example, for, if you start the level order traversal from root, you can basically print out all the children that are non-null. So A and C here, and then you add A and C to a you know, just as a classic level order, you add it to a FIFO queue so that you can then process those things later. So you print AC, you'd add AC to the FIFO queue, then you can look at A's, and then you print its things, add those to the FIFO queue, and so on. So let's look at how this would um, work with code. So we have this level order uh, method here. Um, we have our classic to visit um, FIFO queue um, of nodes. And we obviously start off with the root node. Now, this is slightly different from a normal level tra um, level or traversal. The first reason is um, here we don't when we remove the node that we're examining, we don't print its value uh, immediately there. Um, why is that? Because now, now the nodes do not. Um, contain information themselves, it's their pointers that contain the information. So when we, when we come across a new node, we, we're not going to print, there's nothing to print out, right? We only print out stuff when we're looking at the edges that are non-null. You know, we look, we're looking at the nodes that it's pointing to. So when we remove a node, starting, starting from the root, um, we look at all of the entries in the array. We do that by looping this char val um, from zero to length minus one inclusive. Um, so this loops through all of the elements in the array, the next array of the, of the current node. And if, if it points to a non-null um, node, that means that um, there is a character at that level. So here it's saying we're, we're traversing the try in level order. So if there's a character at that level, then we want to go ahead and print it out. Even if it's not, um, even if it's not like a part of a string, or even if, it, even if it's not the end of a string. As long as it's part of a string somewhere, um, we're going to print it out in level order traversal. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, that that's their intent. So when we ever, whenever we find a non-null link, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and print the character value associated with that link, which we can simply do by casting that char val as a character. That should get us the character immediately. Um, and then what we do is we add that that um, node that it points to, we add that child to the FIFO queue. Okay, so ma the main difference here is, you know, now we're not just considering, um, you know, left node and right node, now we're considering um, 
you know, all possible nodes in the array. But also, um, what we're doing is we're printing out the values of the we're printing out we're printing out the edges pretty much instead of information in the node because the information in the node is not relevant. It's the the information that's relevant is which edge we're taking when we're doing this level border traversal. Um, now notice one thing that might be interesting to you is that, you know, you could also, this would also be valid to, um, to not print the nodes value here, but to print it here. If a binary search tree did not have any value in its root node. Um, so I might just think about that. If you had a binary search tree that didn't have any value in its root node and you're trying to print a level order traversal, then you could also use this method of um, printing the value of the node as you add it. So if this didn't have a value, you'd, you could print this value, you could print this value, you'd add them to the queue, right? Boom, boom. And then when you process this node, then you can print this value and this value, add them to the queue. And then you could print, um, you process this node here, you could print this value and this value and then add to the queue. So th this, this level of traversal actually works in general if your root node doesn't contain um, any information. It's probably not useful for you, but it's just an interesting, an interesting thing. So that's one way of thinking about it with this um, try because we know that the root node is not important. It's what happens after we take a link. So after we travel from the root node to another node. So that's when we have relevant information. Um, so yeah, that's that's why we're printing the values as we see them as children. Um, and this, this does get the level order traversal that we desire. Um, if we go ahead and print this out, we get this T-E-R-E-E-I-E-E-E. T-E-R-E-E-I-E-E. -E -E -E. So everything matches up um, perfectly. So we um, we went over some some good uh, textbook problems for binary search trees that you'll probably see a lot more often, um, like doing a pre-order traversal or a post-order traversal, maybe a level order. Um, we also went over you know doing other uh, related um, methods that are not necessarily in the textbook, but you could easily come up with if you have an intuition for how a binary search tree works like that internal external nodes problem um, and also calculating the height of the binary tree um, the the main the main goals there the main goal there is to really understand the intuition for how a binary search tree works so that you could you know easily come up with um, solutions to, to new problems that um, the UIL computer science program might ask on these tests and then we also went over you know a couple of other problems like um, the family trees, and then with PR 147, the, the um, string tries, um, and this is just drawing on that that hierarchical thinking, um, that recursive thinking, um, and it, each, each, these problems should be solvable given the, the information you know about binary search trees and your intuition with them. Um, so I hope all of these problems were very interesting, and uh, I definitely hope that uh, you know they, they help you with binary search tree problems or um, just general tree problems in the future. Um, and yeah, I hope this tutorial was interesting and helpful. Uh, so I will see you next time.